tomorrow where they expect us to be because they would have some understanding of where we come from. We'd also thought that in any case, any sense of identity as a people, for us to have any sense of that identity as a people, we needed to know who we are, where we come from. I'm sure that uh, some, some of the people here would have uh, heard some of the things that some of us said in the past about what the colonial system did in this country, about to the African people, that this practice of handing out what were called Christian names was a deliberate part of a process of denying any sense of identity. So instead of becoming, known becoming Togo, you became Jane. <laughs> instead of being Kalima, you are Philip. They were saying, no, <clears throat> we have to tell the story about ourselves. Because a very important part of the recovery of this national identity. Many years ago, I had a discussion with the president of Algeria, President Bouteflika. And I said to him, look, we, I think we must write a, get some of our intellectuals to get together to write something about South Africa and Algeria. And I was saying to him that, you see, the, I'm saying this because uh, Algeria and South Africa had the largest numbers of European settlers. And perhaps we might compare the impact of that on our respective histories. And so I said to him, you see, for instance, in the South African case, part of what has happened, you can, you can see it very distinctly that sense of loss of national identity here is very strong, very entrenched. Go to a country like Nigeria, they don't have this problem. So he said to me, uh, during your years of struggle, we sent some Algerian, Algerians to South Africa. We managed to get them French passports, so they went to South Africa as French citizens. It was to look exactly at this question that you, you are raising. What was the impact of the process of colonization on South Africa relative to Algeria? And he said to me, uh, what you are describing about that loss of national identity in South Africa did not happen in Algeria. And the reason it didn't was because of Islam. The religion became so, so entrenched and part of the national character that it didn't matter what French colonialism did. It couldn't deny us our national identity. In your case, you have a different story to tell. So I'm saying, the Sadat project we thought was important to try and do something to tell this story as part of our own process of the recovery of that identity. We decided on an arbitrary date. We said, of course, you can tell this. South African story is very long. But let's start in 1960, up to Liberation Day. Um, I'm saying it was arbitrary, because indeed you could have chosen any other period, but they had to be, of course, some determinate period. 
And indeed, as Isub has uh, uh, described the volumes, uh, volume five and volume six, volume five, part one, and volume six, uh, part one and two, indeed they do discuss a matter about African solidarity with our struggle and these various elements of our history from that, uh, in this particular series, uh, the, the, the volume six discusses 1960, 1990 to 1996. But I think that we, one of the challenges that uh, we face as people who read these books, and I, I'd say, they are, they are some kind of big, thick. You saw the ones that were given to the deputy president. Don't be intimidated, they are quite easy to read. <laughs> uh, what, what lessons do we draw from this history? Sure, it's, it's important to know what's the past, where do we come from? But that history is very relevant to what happens tomorrow. And I think that these volumes pose that kind of challenge. For instance, they talk about these volumes. As Isub has mentioned, the violence, the political violence uh, that occurred in the then Natal, KwaZulu Natal, in the then Transvaal, uh, here in the Gauteng province. Um, Lots and lots of thousands of people died. Once, uh, I think it was 1993, um, we got a request from one of the law firms in Johannesburg, and they said, could we please come? Because there's somebody who wanted to discuss something quite sensitive with us. Um, so I went with Penwell Maduna to the law firm. <coughs> and we met there a, a police officer, a white police officer, special branch. And he said uh, he worked, he was based in Alexander Township in Johannesburg, a special branch. And he said what we used to do, he says we had people in the Alexander Township hostels, um, whom we used to carry out the killings, for instance, on the trains. And of course, there would be halabaloo, and uh, fingers would be pointed at Alexander Township and the, the hostel. He says, what we used then to do is to put old rifles in the hostel. Tell the uniformed branch of the SAP to go and raid the hostel. Tell the media that the raid was coming. So they would raid and indeed capture these old rifles uh, from the First World War. Uh, <coughs> and. Uh, this is success. The South African police are acting against the violence. But of course, the following day, we take them out again, our group, give them real modern weapons, and they go killing. And then he says, uh, he, he comes originally from Devon. So he asked for a transfer to go back to Devon. And indeed, it was granted. Then the special branch ran a, what is called a false flag operation. They wanted to do something which they would blame on the PAC, on APLA. So they did something. The unfortunate thing is that people died. It had nothing to do with PAC. PAC was not anywhere near it. People died. So he says then the senior officers called him and explained this to him to say, look, this is what we did. But the thing went wrong. People have died. Now this uh, must be an investigation. So we want you 
to admit, to make a statement that you were responsible for this. And sign this statement, but you know us, we are the special branch. You, you'll be taken to court, but you'll, be, you'll get acquitted, don't worry. So indeed, he says, I signed. They wrote a statement for me, my officers, and I signed to say I was responsible for this. They have now abandoned me. They are now saying, this is the man who did this terrible thing. So I thought I must come and talk to the ANC to say, what do I do? So we said to him, okay. <clears throat> TRC is coming, go and tell that story to the TRC. I don't know whether he did. But really the reason I'm telling this story is to say, what happened to those people in the Alexander Township hostels who used to be hired, given guns, go and kill? Where are they? Have they, have they become reformed individuals? Or they continue to be in the service of other people? There was uh, another report prepared by a very respectable South African, and he told us that uh, in the course of the work he was doing, he had been asked to do this work, he, was, he found, for instance, that in one small township, a African township in the Western Cape, there were at least 95 agents of the special branch only in the township. And he says, we don't know how many national intelligence uh, people were there, agents, how many military intelligence people were there. That's special branch, small township. And he was saying that, you know, uh, in the course of my work, I found that even family friends, people I have dinner with, were also agents of the system. We had hoped that the TRC, one of the things that it would do, would be to, to tell the story of what used to be called, George, you remember this? Because this was the national security management system. Those structures. Uh, it didn't. We wanted it to tell the story because we thought we would need to dismantle this thing. Because if we didn't, there would be people out there whom we would inherit from the past. We would not know what they did in the past. We would not know who their handlers were, and we would not know how they would be used. I'm saying it didn't happen. But I'm saying uh, this history must surely get us to answer the question. What happened to these people who caused so much destruction, and, and what do we need to do? What did we need to do then, and what do we do need to do now? to make sure that whatever they try, they don't succeed. Again, as Yusuf said, uh, this volume six also deals with problems of the political violence in the country. I think we'll all of us recall that for instance in, uh, in Natal, there was a lot of tribal mobilization. Uh, the IFP uh, presented itself as a Zulu ethnic movement. And some of the violence there related to that, not all. The volumes also talk about issues that have got to do with political transformation in the Bantu stands. We, 
we, during the process of the negotiations, during exactly this period that this volume six is discussing, the ANC decided that uh, it really tries to pursue an old policy. During the course of the struggle, we had thought that it would be important to take advantage of whatever limited political space there would be in the Bantustans to engage in popular mobilization of the people. So during those years, we had quite a lot of contact with some of the political parties in the Bantustans, encouraging them to join the popular struggle. And indeed, uh, I think it is generally known, even in Gata, in Gata was formed at the instance of the ANC to take advantage of this space to see what mobilization we could do to get these masses of the people in the Pantustans to engage in the struggle. But I think we would all of us recognize the fact that what happened during these years of the Pantustan system, this tribal consciousness developed again. I'm told now, Isop says uh, he does not know what passport I travel on and where country, which country I'm in. I'm, no, I don't spend much time in the country, it's true. But I'm told that you now find stickers on cars that says 100% vendor. <laughs> uh, and there are other stickers of, I don't know, 110% Tswana. So you see about what is happening. We, we, we dissolved the Bandustans. All the Bandustan parties, except for the AFP, disappeared. Um, as ANC, we thought that we had managed to draw them into this and became part of the same negotiating team at Quadessa. But I'm saying this history that's told about political transformation and the Bandustans, violence in Natal and all that, surely must get us to answer this question. Did we in fact defeat the tribalism which the apartheid system sought to encourage? I don't think we did. In many ways. <coughs> If Isub said that this Sadet was one of the first presidential lead projects, that's correct. There were other presidential lead projects. I remember one um, when we decided to build a new port uh, at Ngucha, Ngucha in the Eastern Cape, what they call Kucha. That was a presidential lead project. Finance Treasury gave all the money, was available, and so on, and the various procedures agreed uh, about how to disperse this money. Then at some point, we get some very urgent calls from the managing director of the project to say work has come to a standstill because Treasury has not given the money, which came via the government of the Eastern Cape. So we check on this, uh, and what we find is that, in fact, Treasury had sent the money to the Eastern Cape government. And then there were two officials in the government who had to sign documents transferring the money to the project. Now, the pro there, and these two officials sit in one passage in an office building, one passage. One this door, the other one that door, with some doors in between. What had happened was that the messenger was off sick. So <coughs> one official had signed the necessary papers. Now the practice, I'm, I'm told, is that then the messenger will come, collect these papers from this 
official, walk two doors down, and get this other official to sign. As a result of which, then the money would be transferred to the project. The, the, the messenger was off sick. So there was nobody to move this paper. Uh, and that is what caused the delay. Now, I'm raising this because you are talking about an administration in the Eastern Cape which had had to absorb civil servants from the Siskai Bandustan and civil servants from the Transkai Bandustan. And they came into the public service with habits that were born of that system. Have we defeated this heritage? I'm saying this history that is told in this volume must forces us to have to ask these questions in order to be able to say, therefore, what do we do? Again, Isop mentioned the matter of uh, the National Party and the changing of minds. Have the minds changed? We used to have uh, an International Investment Council made up of very important business people from around the world. And we thought it was important to have this institution so that they could advise the government in terms of economic policy, particularly as it would impact on these major investors uh, around the world. One of the matters they constantly raised was something which they said they couldn't understand, which was that the South African company kept a dis disproportionately large amounts of cash. And they said it's not normal. They are not investing this money. They are keeping it as cash. Why? So we said, well, we don't know why. Uh, their own guess was that big corporate South Africa maybe minus MTN and NetBank. <laughs> uh, their own guess was that big corporate South Africa knew, knew this as a matter of fact, that disaster would happen. That if this story about this transition to democracy in South Africa is too good to be true, there is disaster coming down the road. So the best thing for us to do is to have cash in a suitcase so that when the disaster comes, you can't take away the factory, but you can take away the cash. That was their guess. Whether they were right or wrong, I don't know. But these were big international business people, but that was their view. But I'm saying, we have a chapter that discusses the National Party and the changing of the mind. And we talk about national unity, national cohesion, shared patriotism. Are we there? Have the minds changed? I think we must ask these questions. We must ask questions about women's emancipation. Again, it did say quite correctly there's a chapter on this issue. Um, where are we with regard to this important matter of women's emancipation? Indeed, how far are we, how far have we advanced with regard to this struggle reflected in these books, struggle which involved many people, not just ANC and so on, but everybody, um, for the eradication of the legacy of colonialism and apartheid. Where are we? I think we need to answer these questions and look at them critically. And I think this history that's told here will at least say when everybody engaged in this struggle to bring about change, it was to achieve these objectives. And having said that, 
must then answer the question, what progress have we made? What obstacles have we experienced? What do we do? MTN Net Bank thanks. And uh, the lottery also and others who have contributed and I want to join again everybody to say thanks to the contributors to these volumes, as well as the board and the staff of SADET. Um, <coughs> Is Isop might speak about this as we close, about the future. One of the matters which uh, the board has correctly decided is that uh, we need to produce uh, a more popular, popular versions of this book, particularly to be available in the schools. Uh, so that will be done. Um, two or three years ago, we, uh, we had an offer from Steven Stil Spielberg. The cinema goers here will know who Steven Spielberg is. Um, he says that when uh, they did uh, the film Schindler's List, they interviewed a lot of people who had survived the Holocaust. Um, because they needed to make sure that they tell the story correctly in Schindler's List. But then he says this developed into a project of its own. So they just continued, regardless of the film, to record people. So they developed software and all of that so that they set up a system where you have these interviews, uh, put them into uh, the computers in an interactive way, and uh, Steven Spielberg said he's ready, he, he's read enough about our struggle to understand that we too in South Africa could benefit from recording this history of these individuals in that way. And so he offered, he said, uh, I'm ready to give you everything that you need free of charge because I think the South African story is important. We said to him, Mr. Spielberg, wait. We'll come back. I think we'll have to go back to him. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, I'm saying this, this is the future. So to make this history more accessible to many more people. But I'm saying that in making it more accessible, we must also pose the challenge, having read all this and understood all this, what then? Thanks, Isuf. <laughs> Before we started, you know, they have a thing called a holding room. And so Komitabo said to me, but Isup, what is a keynote address? I said, I really don't know. <laughs> and now in the course of my life and working with him, I've learned a great deal. Tonight I've learned something else. Now I know what the keynote address is. <laughs> As we wind up, the first thing I'd like to do is I would like to ask the members of the board to please join me here on the platform. Please come. <laughs> That's Vincent Mapai. Well, I know him as Comrade Kofsi, <laughs> yeah, Isaac Makopo, Dr. Matlo, who is no longer uh, CEO of uh, AISA, and now he tells me he's a consultant, so if anybody looking for specialists, he's <laughs> available. <laughs> Angie Maloka. Yvonne Mutien, who was, as I mentioned, from the beginning with us. Greg, who for some years also served as the CEO. Minister Lindy Weir Sisulu. You've been on the board from the very beginning. Seth Palachi, who's been heading the finance committee for 
all of these years and has been a mainstay of the board. Sifiso, who is the present CEO, who I must say, and I must give him credit, has been running this organization now pretty single-handedly. With the assistance, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to come. With the assistance of Elsa Kruger, Elsa, please come. Without Elsa, there would have been no subject. And Lindy, when they want to employ too many civil servants, take Elsa. Single-handedly, she was running our office for nearly 13 years. And Elsa, to you on behalf of the board, because this is our last public meeting, I want to say thank you for everything you did. Even when Elsa was very sick, or the husband was very sick, Elsa would still be at work. <laughs> Elsa, thank you, thank you very, very much. There are two things left that we have to do. I'm going to be very, very quick. The first is on behalf of the board to present These volumes to Comrade Tabo in Becky. It should be very heavy on him to manage to carry them. Uh, and now I'd like to ask a representative from each of the family of our board members who had left us. Because on behalf of the board, we'd like to present these copies at this event to the families of the board members who are no longer with us. Naledi, are you coming? Um, who, who, Kugu, are you coming from? Who else is here? Uh, Ned Bankrad, LT, I forgot Isaac Mays. Yeah. Who was that? Ned Bankrad, LT, oh, Isaac yeah. Mays. And then what about Masanga? The yeah. family of Masanga. Who's here from Masanga? Is there anybody here from General Masondo's oh, family? Yeah. Oh, they didn't respond. Sorry, so we'll I get it to them. Yes. Uh, come. This is Gugu. I've been hearing about her a lot in this last week. <laughs> Minister, please come. Minister, on behalf of the board, this is in recognition of the great contribution by Uncle Joe Matthews. For those of you who don't know, Naledi happens to be the daughter of Uncle Joe. 